one last word that I heard from Swami is Bhaktulu. Because devotees are of prime concern for Bhagwan. So there definitely is a divine link, I believe, between Dharmakshetra and Anantapur. In the very first discourse that Swami gave, 53, he says people can be divided into four categories. There might be people in this audience who belong to two eras, before 2011 and post-2011. And our experiences should come together at some plane of thinking for us all to connect together as Bhagwan's devotees. That should be my humble endeavor today. When we get invites to a Samarpan talk, I ask myself, what is the relevance of a program like Samarpan? This time around, Bhagwan inspired me with three or four particular reasons why Samarpan is pertinent. Number one, Samarpan is an excellent opportunity for personal sadhana. For the speaker from the time he or she is invited, he or she has to keep thinking of Bhagwan, indulge in his thoughts, see how you can be an inspiration to so many others who come, all at the time, same time, making sure you're not egoistic about what you're going to be sharing with devotees. The organizers are working at multiple levels to put the program together. It's a personal sadhana for them. So everybody connected with the program itself has some amount of personal sadhana involved in this program. Point number two. When the divine being was available in the physical form, it is the students who were the biggest beneficiaries of that form and its proximity. And when it is time for thanksgiving, this idea conceived and executed by the alumni, I think is one of the best forms of thanksgiving because it allows people to hear and know of his endless glory. The third reason I think Samarpan is relevant. You know, when the Ram Avatar happened, Sage Valmiki wrote the Ramayana. When the Krishna Avatar happened, Sage Vyasa recorded it all for us. When the Sai Avatar's life and glory has to be recorded for posterity, Satyam Shivam Sundaram falls short. I feel every Samarpan talk is scripting a page in the endless epic of Sai Avatar. Each of us has to write, contribute that one page to get it all together as the epic that talks about the Sai Avatar. It is important to have Samarpan as in this context. The fourth and the final reason. Every generation has its own set of experiences. Every generation experiences the divine in its own form, in its own manner. And we need to pass it on to the next generation and the next and the next because who knows who finds inspiration from whose faith and whose experience. Coming to think of it, all of us, each of us sitting here, if we took a minute, we all have a story about how we came to Bhagwan or how Bhagwan came into our lives. And it might be so unique if, if only we could talk to each one and find out, hey, how did Swami enter your lives? I'm sure we will hear very, very interesting stories. If you start with 50s and 60s, Professor Kasturi. He had just lost his elder son and the son's friend was coming to visit them. 
and the son's friend's train was crossing dharmavaram he was a believer in baba so he said how can i pass by dharmavaram and not get down and go to puttaparthi so let me do that so he gets off goes to puttaparthi tells swami about his friends passing away swami gives him a handful of vibhuti packets and says give it to the mourning parents and then this friend comes gives the packets to professor kasturi professor kasturi wonders how a few packets of ash can ever ever give consolation to bereaved parents of course with no faith in what happened he passes on the vibhuti packets to a neighbor who believed in shirdi baba swami was making an effort to enter his life already his life already to the 80s i was a little girl going to 7th standard 6th or 7th standard one afternoon i remember this very vividly i was playing in the backyard of the house and then my father came in with a picture of baba and two books so the minute i saw this photograph i said who is this man with such weird hair and then i was chastised and i was told he is not man he is god man you can't talk so irreverently about him i said oh okay and the picture and the book was given to him by a friend's friend who told them that there was a place called puttaparthi and it is a very holy place to visit and there was this holy person who does performs miracles it was a brief less than 5 minutes conversation the picture and the book went to some corner of the house nobody ever looked at it the books lay totally undisturbed in the bookshelves and that was the end of the matter a couple of months later there was in the neighborhood one mrs kalyani ayengar a hardcore devotee whom bhagwan had visited when he came to kerala so she meets us and she tries to cajole me to go into what she called bal vikas this is very new so she was telling my mother you know all the children in the neighborhood it's good for them to come to bal vikas because they'll become good children so i kind of looked at her and said i'm already good i don't need to come <laughs> and my mother was uh good enough to say yeah we'll see then she, she told my mother uh, you know we have bhajans wouldn't you want to come she said i'll see if i have the time i'm a working woman you know i don't really have the time and then a few days later she was persistent and she told my mother you know a lot of us from here we are traveling to puttaparthi would you like to come with us my mother literally scoffed at her she says and says oh i don't have time for all this and the matter closed once again there were two knocks and then we didn't open the door <laughs> so the third time so if you don't let him in he storms in <laughs> so the third time this is many months later my mother developed a gynec problem so every doctor in town was visited the best of medication was prescribed months on end she took treatment nothing really worked finally they decided to have a surgery and this was a challenge because i was a little girl both my parents were working relatives were far and few between staying far away not in town so it would be a challenge to have a surgery in these circumstances but they had no choice so they decided to go ahead the pay wards were booked the surgery date was fixed the doctor was constantly monitoring her to prepare her for the surgery and our mrs kalyani ayengar makes her appearance again somewhere on the road when we are going somewhere so she says how are you doing and my mother is desperate the last straw on the camel's back so she said oh no not really good she's desperate right so she said you know we have been having this and we have this real problem and i have nothing has cured me so she said would you try some vibhuti my mother said yeah yeah anything anything so she gave some vibhuti and taught my mother the vibhuti mantra and the next day literally the next day 
my mother chanted so devoutly the vibhuti mantra and took the vibhuti three times a day and the problem simply vanished a problem of 8 to 9 months now it was the turn of the doctor to be shocked because we had to go and cancel the surgery baba had happily invaded our lives and my mother became an incurably fanatic devotee incurably fanatic because unabashedly she would stop people and start talking about baba now so at work she worked in the university so at work there were colleagues who would be stopped in the middle of a lunch and talked about sai baba and they'd be laughing at her and she's unmindful so that's how swami colonized our lives happily and there is no decolonization when he comes in now this happened of course after that every sunday was in the adopted village i don't remember one evening without going for a bhajan reluctantly or otherwise and the only one stop holiday destination that i remember after that incident is puttaparthi i wasn't glad then about it but today i'm glad about it now this happens 50s 60s 70s 80s what happens after 2011 whether we all like it or no there might be people in this audience who belong to two eras before 2011 and post 2011 and our experiences should come together at some plane of thinking for us all to connect together as bhagwan's devotees that shall be my humble endeavor today so how did bhagwan come into people's lives after 2011 I had this colleague at Anandpur Dr Pratima Tripathi She came from Lucknow She joined in October 2011 She did not know that there was a place on the map of India called Puttaparthi or Anandpur How did she land up there So 2011 April she finished her phd thesis in lucknow she was looking for a job she went around to multiple colleges in and around her place everybody said we don't have a vacancy for a newcomer we need experienced people she was turned away she was she says she's totally completely frustrated so one evening when she turned on the television we all know what the television and the media did in april 2011 there was some good channel they're just talking about sri satyasai baba's projects and it showed the university and the educational institutions so she said oh this looks interesting so she sat through she watched the whole thing and then she said oh they are saying he's god and he has so many institutions and here i am struggling for a livelihood maybe if he's god he will you know get me a job total stranger who had not even heard of sai baba mind you she shut down the channels went to the tv went to bed two days later a relative of hers calls her and says did you hear about a university called satyasai university they are talking about it in the news the gentleman also didn't know of baba nor was he a devotee why don't you apply you are so desperate for a job she put in her application the next day she got a response saying please attend an interview in one week and she was at anandpur as a faculty in one month and she came there total new she didn't even know she had to wear a sari the dress code you know we had to but she got along she she gelled into the system so quickly that she kept telling us i don't feel i came all the way south i don't feel i'm seeing new people everything seems like part of my family and today she is a hardcore 
devotee of Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba. Swami still has his ways of entering people's lives. Now there is one thing that distinguishes those who came to Bhagwan before 2011 and after 2011. The Darshanam, the Sparshanam and the Sambhashana. These were distinctive aspects of the avatar that people enjoyed if they came before 2011. We must admit this has ceased post-2011 because there is either the physical form or it is not there. There isn't a via media form. There isn't a form other than the physical or the no physical. So, I want to pick up a few examples of my fond memories of darshan, sparshan and sambhashan and relive those memories with you. Why am I choosing to do this? Well, when I was a student in the 90s, one particular winter vacation, a few of us who stayed back got this blessing of attending Purnachandra sessions with Bhagwan every afternoon. It was restricted to only the students and the staff. The Purnachandra shutters would be half open, we would all go in, Bhagwan would come, sit with us, talk very informally, a lot of profound things, and then we would also have our tea and snacks with Bhagwan before he went out for darsh. On one of those days, one thing that Swami said, and I have noted down in my notebook, so he suddenly called somebody and said, he was talking to us about the art of public speaking that day. He said, how should one speak in public? So everybody gave different answers. And then Swami went on to elaborate. Swami said, when you speak, you should be convincing. How can you be convincing? You can be convincing only when you are convinced yourself. And what are you most convinced about? You are most convinced about your own personal experience. So speak your personal experiences, Swami said. That's one reason I thought I could share some experiences without hesitation. Even while I was thinking of this, just a few days before I left to Mumbai, somebody in Puttaparthi was talking to me and reminded me of a conversation that Bhagwan had had in Kodekinal with the students. There was this boy who was getting a lot of attention from Swami. So one day he made bold and asked Bhagwan, Swami, are we even deserving of this much of attention from you? Swami said, don't ask questions. Enjoy it when you have it. When you don't have it, recall these moments and enjoy them. So I would think recalling these moments should in some way amount to our enjoying them in person with Bhagwan. In that spirit. When we talk about darshan, what comes to our minds is the Sai Kulvanth Hall. Beautiful soothing music starts, breaks the silence. Bhagwan comes gliding by in his majestic form with the halo behind, stands at the gate on the lady's side, which is at raised. He looks around. All eyes are turned to one direction. Humanity at its best stillness. And then he starts walking. And then we start speculating 
Is it in this direction or that? Is it my letter or hers? Is he going to pick the akshantalu or is he going to throw a toffee at me? And maybe we lost a lot of meaningful moments speculating this. Alas, it's a little too late now. But I want to recall one or two of the special darshans that come back to my mind. It was again the early 90s. Holidays, we would somehow try to stay on at Prashanti Nilayam because you could probably catch a special moment or two with Bhagwan. He will have this special corner for those children who haven't gone home for vacation because they want to spend it with Swami. So this time, Bhagwan was clearing up, Bhagwan was still staying in the Prashanti Mandir. He was clearing up all the stock all the goodies, all the tiny, tiny gifts that he gives, which had piled up in his rooms. So the upper veranda was full of activity after morning darshan. And luckily for me, we were staying in East Prashanti. So if you came out to the corridor after the morning bhajan, we would rush and catch a place because there was so much of rush, the veranda was full. Because Bhagwan was busily going up and down the upper veranda, getting things cleaned and cleared. So you would suddenly see an orange splash there. But in a couple of days, around 11 in the morning, Swami started coming to the balcony, the balcony above the interview room, the ladies' side. And he started dropping gifts to people gathered there. So now everybody, fortunately, we were allowed to go in, the students. So we would get, come inside the gate, just nobody else in the entire darshan hall. So the, the boys, the gen side students would wait right under the balcony and you will find the Santa Claus there on top. A teddy bear falling, a camera falling, a, 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 a number of things being dropped and people catching. Of course, that was a sight because it is so beautiful to see Swami in this role. Now we would be, the boys would catch the things and girls would stand and watch. So uh, we would be at a distance and I feel grateful because probably the things would perish but the memory of seeing him is so, so etched in my mind today while I grumbled about it then. So about 20 feet or so away we would be standing and we'd be watching him dropping things and sometimes saying, no, this is for you. No, you, this is for you. are dropping it to particular people. So this was a memory that was so beautiful. You know, that's not a role that you often see. Somebody dropping from the first floor things to the ground floor. Swami. When I grew up, I, I, of course, I grew up with a little bit of annoyance that Bhagawan was throwing only to the boys and not to the girls. But as we mature and grow, we learn to see lot more than what meets the eye. So I said, there is so much meaning in this. When God drops something for you, are you alert and ready enough to catch it? It could be anything. It could be an opportune moment. It could be a moment of grace. It could be a coincidence in your life. But when he drops, are we alert and ready at all points to catch it? That's important. Imagine if God dropped it and you didn't catch it. That would be regretful. So I graduated to more mature thinking. And I would say, oh, beautiful thought. So alertness is the message. You know, we should always be alert for God. Nearly a decade later, one day in the summer, we were all inside Thrai. Those beautiful Thrai sessions that Bhagwan would have with us. When Bhagwan finished the Thrai session and he was coming out, there were mangoes for prasadam. So, this lady who was showing the tub of mangoes to Bhagwan, usually he blesses it and then asks for it to be distributed. But he started giving the mangoes one by one to those in front. And that day, he didn't want to leave out anybody. 
nearly 50 people at this distance. He started throwing mangoes to each one of us. And believe me, every one, every single person in the hall got a mango from Swami without missing the catch. He would look at you and then you know it's yours because people are crowded and everybody's craning their necks. So he would look at you, lock his eyes so you know it's for you and then he throws it straight at you because he can never miss his aim and then you shouldn't miss it. So every one of us caught a mango. Uh, so a decade later, this dream of Swami throwing something and I catching it came true for me. But today I feel it's all about catching those beautiful moments that he will give us. If only we keep our eyes open, so many things happen in our lives. Every day, a moment of grace, a blessing in disguise, a message from a book. All these are those things that he's dropping at us. If we haven't caught it, it is gone. Yet another darshan, an unusual image that stays in my mind, is the good old days in Vrindavan. The Sairam shed was a much smaller shed with a tree in the middle and a small shed around, very near the gate, unlike the Sai Ramesh hall today. So when Bhagwan finished darshan in the Sai Ramesh hall, he would talk to people. Swami says, when I'm with men, I am a man. When I'm with women, I am a woman. When I'm with children, I am a child. When I'm alone, I am God. So he would finish this round of darshan in his multiple human roles. And then when Swami walks back those 20 feet or odd to enter the three gates, those days, not many people flanked around him. So you would find, you just see the slender back of Bhagwan gracefully gliding on the sands. And that's an image that has stayed in my mind forever. And I would think that is the solitariness of the Supreme Being when I see him go. And then I would wonder, how does he do these two roles so easily? He was so human, he was touching a baby, he was writing home in somebody's slate, he was uh, throwing toffees at somebody this minute. And the next minute, you find a divine aloofness in him. How does he do this so seamlessly to be so human and so divine all at the same time? And then the response to it came. Yet another time, early 90s, summer course was on. The summer course, 15 day long summer course was over. We had given our exams, which we had at the end of summer course. All the campuses were gearing up to leave back to their campuses. Swami decided to give us a treat before we left. So he called us all into the college auditorium just the students and the staff. We all went in there. So we got all the doors closed because it is going to be a private session with just his children. And Swami started talking to us that day about his childhood. So he was talking about poor Satya who didn't have a second pair of clothes, remember? who gave his books to somebody to meet the expenses of going all the way to Pushpagiri Scouts. He walked all the way. He talked about the meager ragi balls that he had for a meal. And Swami, the descriptive ability that he has, hooked us with attention. And we were all listening with rapt attention at the story of this poor little Satya. And a lot of us were crying and sobbing, thinking of the turmoils that Swami had gone through as a child. So human it was. And literally the entire audience, spellbound, 
was shedding tears at how how challenging sami's childhood was that's a kind of story he was telling us even as he came to a long narration of his story he suddenly said kani yuga yugantarulu ee chethilo unnai suddenly but yugas are in these palms namakam lekapothe chudandi if you don't believe see it and his hand went in circles and he created a beautiful diamond studded pendant then swami told us the story he said this is the nala damayanti mangal sutra when nala and damayanti had to communicate with each other across the lake there was the swan we should carry messages for them so when they were getting married nala asked damayanti swami said what should we have as a mangal sutra and she said let's have the swan so it was a beautiful three dimensional gold swan studded with diamonds sami brought it he didn't stop there he came down he went row by row showing it to all of us for the boys in between every row for the girls side along the aisles middle passage so all of us had a close look at this distance and as he was going up the stairs back it vanished so here he was trying his best to tell us how human how was a small boy he didn't have proper clothing he didn't have proper food he had so much of trouble to do the little things of daily life and if anybody got disillusioned into it then deluded into it the next minute he showed that he's actually not that I, i recall something now you know it seems somebody asked swami a group of students of course this is something i've heard a group of students asked swami swami what is difficult for you to achieve as an avatar swami said no nothing is difficult for me what's difficult for me no swami there might be something that you don't find easy to do and swami said to all the time behave like a human being was difficult so you know if we know very little and we want to always you know some small piece of information let's say we know somebody is talking and we know that information we are all eager to show off that we know that but imagine swami knows everything and he has all the time behave like he didn't know anything he said that must have been tough i believe so 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 that is uh, swami now these are examples of darshan in the physical form that i'm talking about what happens now if somebody wants to have a darshan you don't have to go any place he will come to you there is this classmate and a good friend of mine she is uh the chief manager of corporation bank tirupur so she was working in coimbatore branch and she got this transfer to tirupur branch tirupur all of us know is the is an industrial area full of textile industry so it is an export foreign currency transaction branch high level transactions because it is industrial so when she got this transfer 3 years ago she said she started receiving calls from her bank friends not actually congratulating her but telling her you're really taking this offer you know tirupur it's an industrial area you can have all kinds of fake transactions it is meant for a rough and tough man it is not a woman's job maybe you should think about it there isn't a history of a lady able to handle that branch well because of the toughness of the job so when repeatedly people told her this 
she started wondering i mean did i make a mistake by accepting this promotion transfer offer then she said sami whatever has come my way i've taken it as being sent by you now why am i distinguishing you be with me you are the only one who will see me through she just said this and she says she received a whatsapp message now all of us get hundreds of forwards in a day half of them not really meaningful also and this message when she opened it said god is with you he is ahead of you he is beside you he is behind you he is always with you this looks very ordinary mundane everybody forwards messages but tell me what is the chance that of all the hundreds of people forwarding hundreds of messages sends you this message to that girl at that point of time that is something we our rational minds refuse to think when we think of coincidences it could have come the next day it could have come the previous day it could have gone to somebody else she need not have seen it then there's multiple chances so the fact that this message came kind of consoled her and she said thank you swami you are there the matter doesn't end there so the day came for her to take charge she went to tirupur she has the habit of placing swami's chair in the manager's cabin any branch she goes to so she placed the place swami's throne she lit the lamp she did uh, offer her pranams and she sat on her chair so everybody in the branch came and welcome ma'am congratulations ma'am the routine thing happened courtesies and then she opened the drawer of the manager's table to start putting in her things and she found that the drawer was not cleared the earlier manager had left it with a lot of unwanted papers and junk so she had to clear the drawer before she start putting in her things ideally if you are the chief manager you have to just call the attender and say just clear this go drop it all in the bin because it all looked very waste paper and unwanted paper she said i don't know for what reason i started rummaging through the paper taking one by one and what falls out a picture of bhagwan baba in a tirupur corporation bank manager's cabin and that's not enough because there are doubting thomases like you and me in that picture is printed the words god is with you always he goes ahead of you he is beside you he is behind you he is with you the exact same message that she had received is printed on the same picture of swami that she got so swami had indeed gone ahead of her and taken the job for himself so she said oh this is very nice but then you know we always want more and more confirmation so she said maybe the earlier manager was a devotee and so he kept it by mistake so there were these people who were coming in in due course when she got familiar with the staff she said so the earlier manager oh uh, yeah so so everybody was curious because she puts the swami's chair everybody kind of asks her and she has to talk about swami so so she uh, asked them and they said oh madam that earlier manager he he was a non believer he didn't even believe in god why would we have sai baba in his uh, draw so if now swami wants to find a way to come to us he knows much more intelligent ways than you and i know to arrive at our door step let us not get misled sparshan as soon as we talk about sparshan what immediately comes to our minds is the pad namaskar that we all wide for you know darshan ground early till bhagwan stopped pad namaskar for some time and resumed it but before that there was be such a rush to touch his feet i remember professor g venkatraman once made a joke while talking in kulvant hall he said it is no more manasa bhajare guru charanam it is manasa grabare guru charanam everybody is grabbing bhagwan's feet when he walks 
so well that was that is and that was our idea of a sparshan from the lord but let me recall two beautiful blessed moments of sparshan that stand out in my memory they are very personal and bear with me for that but it's a lot of joy to remember those moments when i finished my studies there was a one year break before bhagwan told me to join the university and that one year i was doing the security duty that you find the alumni doing at prashant nilayam not that bhagwan needed security but he just gave us an opportunity to convenience the devotees who come there so one of those days when i was doing this duty i was sitting in the front block and to my right was dr neelam desai a cardiologist in bhagwan's hospital to my left was another very senior and important devotee lady and those years swami used to come very early as early as 6:37 for darshan so swami came swami looked at dr neelam and said uh aaj kitna operations she said six swami six operations and then he i was in the bit between he looked at the lady beside and said hamara hospital ka doctor hai roz six or eight operations karta hai bahut acha seva karta hai swami ka doctor hai when swami said this literally i was under his nose so i was just watching swami there was such a gleaming pride in swami's eyes when he said hamara doctor hai no pride twinkling in his eyes and somehow i fell for that look in his eyes such a gleam such a twinkle it was a very simple incident but for me it 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 really changed so much of my goal in life i feel after i went back after duty and i wrote this down in my book i read it before i came here just just to recharge myself i said swami will a day come when i make you feel so proud when you say this is my student my girl with pride so somehow there is a secret silent desire in me because that that face is something i can't forget when swami said hamara doctor hai so i was thinking will swami ever feel proud of his children like this will i give him a chance to feel proud of me like this it's just so very very it's 1994 or 5 that i'm talking 5 that i'm talking about uh, of course the incident uh, off and on came to my mind but it was not a continuous thing uh, in a year bhagwan uh bless me to join the university as faculty so that is like going into a treadmill test all of us who are part of the organization know this so if you are part of the organization there is no stopping there is continuous treadmill test going on there will be stressful moments they are specifically custom made for you and uh there'll be constant monitoring like in the treadmill test they monitor the heart rate and the breathing rate right so here you will be monitored for your ego for your dedication for your and then you get a knock now and then but it's all under the vigilance of the cardiologist it's all under the vigilance of the divine director so it's it's a happy treadmill test any case so i moved on to that role and then around 2004 one day or for a few days i kept feeling every sunday we would go to puttaparthi from anandpur i kept feeling i'm not getting the attention that i deserved okay so i said oh swami is not coming my way swami is not looking at me swami hasn't given me a namaskar for long now that's not enough swami says 
I am man is half truth. I am not animal is the other half truth. Now the other half of this truth was he was not only not coming near me or giving me attention, he was giving attention according to me to all the insincere people around me. Now that aggravated my problem, in my mind at least. I said, Swami, so and so actually was doing this last week, was rude, was didn't do this, didn't participate in this, and you went straight to that person and gave. No, I was continuously, you know, this is, this is the mistake we all make even now. There was, a, I'm just digressing a little because I remembered something else. There was this uh, uh, teacher who was um, uh, seeking Bhagwan's permission to do a PhD. So she wanted to compare something with something else. Swami said, no comparison. Comparison, depression, always. So it's when we compare uh, one person with another or one instance with another that we, it, it leads to unhappiness. Now this can happen to us every day. So here I was, not only unhappy that I was not receiving attention. Now first thing to notice, it is all about attention because those years you are not grown up or matured enough to understand that Swami's attention and affection is very different from his love and grace. Attention and affection can be more publicly noticed but his love and grace in our lives is so personal to each of us, isn't it? So I hadn't learned that then. So here I was and one day this frustration and bitterness reached its peak. So I said, Swami, this is totally unfair. I haven't even had a namaskar. I haven't had you come my way for so long. I am kati with you. Now you have many other friends. So kati. I'll just keep doing my work. You carry on with whomever you're happy with. And when we are immature, we do these things. And I forgot about this. And I, so, so I was saying this to a colleague who was there and I said, I'm really annoyed with Swami, you know. And she said, what are you saying? I said, yeah, I, I'm really cutty with him and if he really wants to make up, he has to do something extraordinary. This time I am not going to relent. In about half an hour or so, I received a call from Prashanti Nilayam. There was this lady who called me and said, we are organizing a program and I want you to be a part of that. Would you like to be? So I was dilly-dallying and I was saying, oh, I don't know, I'll think it over. I'm not sure. I thought of a lot of ramifications. I said, I'll just think it over and get back. I cut the call and I mentioned to this colleague, you know, this call was this. She said, hey, don't you think that was Swami? You just told him that you want his attention and then there is an opportunity for you to do something in front of his physical presence. Why are you even thinking? I said, oh, I didn't think in that angle. Okay, okay. So I immediately called back and said, yes, I am in. So, it was a week or 10 days to go for the program. We had this uh, panel discussion on, in front of Bhagwan on the relevance of Mother Sita in today's world. So, Bhagwan was sitting on the dais. We were sitting just a little away from him. We had this panel discussion. It went well. Bhagwan was immensely pleased. He, I'll, I'll cut this short. I want to just mention the parts that are relevant here. So, of course, he finished the thing and he got up in his place and he said, he asked me, what's your name? Now, I was behind a table and chair, so I couldn't go all the way out. And isn't it very awkward to shout your name to Swami in front of crowds watching you? So, I was in a little embarrassment. But luckily, somebody near me went ahead and said, Swami. So I said, Swami Rani. He came closer. He created the ring. And then, of course, some uh, conversation happened. He asked all of us who are participants, who wants the ring? He asked. Next, bait. So everybody was, at least we were wise enough to say, Swami, whomever you want to give. And then, with his eyes, he beckoned me. So I went. As soon as I went, he said, Nuvu, mana ammai kadu? Aren't you our girl? Mana college lo chadvavu? And I'm not answering. Because 
a moment, it was an epiphanous moment. Something of 10 years back came back looking at those eyes and that face. The same glint of pride for a few seconds. Look at the ways he finds to fulfill when it's a desire concerning him. I said, yes, Swami. So, point one knocked off. Then, you know, we haven't seen Swami put around a lady or jewel that is created. So, I cupped my hands to receive the ring. He pushed aside my hands and looked for my fingers. Now, you cannot show your left hand to Swami. So, I showed my right hand like this. So, I said, Swami can... He pushed it aside, took this hand, took this finger and slipped it in. So that was one time when his hands held mine. But the crux of the story is not here. I went back, it was a beautiful day, morning and evening, he made us feel so special. I went back to the hostel. And then, you know, all the children and girls came around and said, Ma'am, show your ring. And a lot of excitement was happening. Until one of the girls who met me said, Ma'am, how lucky. Today is friendship day. I said, what? (laughs) Now, I hadn't heard of this, honestly. So I said, oh, really? Now, I didn't know what this meant also. This is August 1st, 2004. So I was taken aback, but I didn't know what exactly this friendship day was. So I said, oh really? Oh, how nice. I didn't know. I waited for the children to leave. And I quickly went to Professor Google and said, friendship day. And then it said, the first Sunday of every August is celebrated as International Friendship Day. Remember, I told him, Kati, I'm not friends with you. And he chose that particular day specifically just to ensure that I don't miss the point. That is beloved Bhagwan. One more instance of Sparshan. This was 2006. I had gone through a major road accident on my way from Prashant Nilayam to Whitefield. In the first instance, we survived the accident because when message was taken to Bhagwan, it was a Sunday morning, we were to just reach for the uh, darshan in another half an hour, half an hour before Whitefield, the fog and the driver, whatever. We had a head-on collision with a truck. So when the message was taken to Bhagwan, he said it in one line. Swami said, Gandam Dataru. They have overcome the obstacle. Means nothing. I had another teacher with me. But well, uh, it was a difficult time. But Bhagwan's abundant grace combined with Dr. Sundaresh's medical expertise and the goodwill of all my students and Satisai fraternity. I went through two major surgeries and there were hopes of my walking again. So, after about three months in bed, I was now trying to take my baby steps on crutches. The accident occurred in February. And this was May. When the end of May came, I had to seek Bhagwan's consent to join back work, if he said so, or take another semesters off because I was still just about coping with the new changes in my life. So it was May 27th. All the teachers who had come, they took this special spot between Kalyan Mandap and Sai Ramesh, uh, sorry, and Trai, waiting for Bhagwan to come around to grant them Padnamaskar before the new semester started. It was a practice. Swami would give us blessings before we started the new semester. So for the first time now, 
I had to be on sitting on a chair, not squatting. And that means end of the row, somewhere behind. So I was sitting on the chair with my crutches. Bhagwan came. He spoke to the then principal, created Vibhuti, told her to give it to each of us. Even as she finished giving to the first two people, he stopped her and said, Valaimaindi, accident I navalu. What happened to those two teachers who had the accident? Then she said, Swami, they are here. They have come for darshan today. So he looked for us. So the two of us walked. They said Swami was calling. That is a good distance. Swami's chair. And I was struggling to manage walking with my crutches. We reached face to face with him and it was the first face to face after he had saved my life and showered such an amount of grace. So obviously the minute I looked at Swami and Swami asked me so lovingly, Ippudu etla undi? How are you all now? And before even I could answer, I broke down and I said, Swami, you saved our lives. We are alive today because of you. And even as I was sobbing and saying, with me was Kiran Bala ma'am, who had also met with the same accident. She had had a head injury. So she laid her head at Swami's feet to thank him because she was nearly gone and she came back to life. When she finished and raised her head, Swami said, Tisko. He told me, take namaskar. So with my crutches, because I can't leave my crutches, I'm still not off crutches. My feet won't hold me still. I bent to touch his feet. And that was the best of moments and the worst of moments because here was Bhagwan granting me a namaskar and there was I falling a few inches short of reaching his feet. I couldn't bend enough to reach. I was just there but, but, but just couldn't reach it. And tears flowed down my eyes onto Swami's robe. But Bhagwan the most gracious one that he is. He doesn't allow embarrassments. The minute he realized I was not reaching his feet, he said, Bend cheyodhu, hand patko. Don't bend, hold my hand. And he raised his right hand. My eyes were clouded with tears that I couldn't see Swami's hand. I had to search for it. And then I held it for two seconds. That is one sparshan that will, the memory of which, the impact of which will go with me to the grave. What happens to these beautiful moments of sparshan if it is post-2011. It was the October of 2011. We were still trying hard to cope with the major change in our lives. For Dasara, there is this Prashanti Vidwan Mahasabha where in the evenings people share their experiences. So I was requested to share my experiences on one of the evenings. I kept thinking and thinking what to speak. And I couldn't come to terms with the fact that to my right is not that flame orange resplendent form, but the white marble. This time when I go to speak, I couldn't come to terms with it. So I kept thinking, Swami, I have the responsibility to reach out to the devotees. 
but i have to be first in tune with that i was battling with this thought when i woke up on the day of my talk october 1st i woke up like a normal day i was going about my morning activities when i felt there was a lightness to my step and there was some joy in my heart and when i was brushing my teeth i suddenly remembered that i had had a dream of bhagwan and then it was i recapitulated quickly got back to my place and i sat down silently to recapitulate the dream it was vivid in my dream i was seeing bhagwan in the april of 2011 that scene that none of us wants to remember kulvant hall the casket the glass door and the scene was repeating in my dream and i was telling myself i don't want to go anywhere near there and see that so i was keeping a far distance when but your curiosity so i suddenly saw i was speaking at him from a distance to see the face and i saw that it was bright effulgent resplendent not what i had imagined or maybe seen and even as i was seeing sami's eyes opened and i sprang backwards in fear in my dream and i saw gradually sami's palms stretching and beckoning like he did but i wasn't ready to take that one step ahead to go close it is still that glass casket right he beckoned me a second time i still didn't move he beckoned me a third time with a slight movement of his fingers and i went so he stretched out his palm i stretched out mine and he placed it on my hands and the first immediate sensation feeling that i got is the warmth of that palm the dream continued but this part is important i didn't know what this meant of course i told you i was battling with the idea of is he there is he not there i will not go to swami's chair to take his namaskar and then sometimes when you are speaking in front of him he will give you a tip or two idi cheppu atla cheppu as not going to have all of it this time that was worrying me bothering me so i had i recapitulated this and then i debated in my mind whether i should mention it in the talk or not i said i'll keep it private but about an hour before the talk somebody called me to wish me uh, good luck and i said you know i had this dream she said i think you must say it because i believe warmth stands for life and love what is warmth of anything that is life full of life is warm and love is warm sami was assuring you of both of these you should say this so this darsparshan and the impact of a sparshan continues even after 2011 let us not despair time is running out the third aspect of the divine form sambhashan the first time i remember bhagwan talking to me was as an eight standard girl working closely with a program from the adopted village for the onam celebrations after the program bhagwan called the entire program team to give us namaskar and sarees so there was next to me the lady from the adopted village one of the representatives and sevadals so she was sitting there and then it was i so when swami came to her she told swami swami amma kodambu serilla 
Swami, my mother's health is not good. Swami nearly behaved like he didn't hear her and he carried forward and reached in front of me. And then as though to reply to her, Swami said, Onnuda ammakku parthita alayam. For your mother, Puttaparthi is the resort. Now this was an answer to her. It was said to me in front of me. And this is 1985. There was no big chance or small chance that my mother or my parents would ever come and stay in Puttaparthi for good in 1985. But today, they have a place only in Puttaparthi for the last 15 years. Swami is the only one who sees the future. The only one. And today, they are so happy to be in Puttaparthi. And I suddenly remember, I didn't connect it until some day when my mother actually fell very ill and we took her to the hospital and, you know, she wanted to go for bhajan the other day. And when I put this together, I remember what Swami said 20 years ago to somebody else in front of me. So that is the power of his sambhashan. Yet another time, I was a student, Swami was inaugurating 91, super speciality in Puttaparthi was getting inaugurated. Winter holidays, all of us pleaded with Swami for an interview. We were very few, a couple of teachers who hadn't gone home for vacation and about 13 students who hadn't gone for vacation. Please Swami, please. Swami, as usual, as was the practice, called the teachers in. But students, not always. So he said, please Swami, please Swami, we pleaded and he allowed us to go into the interview room. And the interview room became really tight, packed, crowded because there's so many of us. We had a beautiful interview with Bhagwan. The interview was over and Swami had to really make place, you know, step on our toes to literally come out, come in and out because it's very crowded. Swami came out. We also came out behind him after the interview and then we sat in a line expecting to get a namaskar. Look at the human mind. You have a full one and a half hours interview right under his nose and you still are discontent. You're asking for a two second namaskar. Okay, that's the human mind. So we sat but Swami went past after bhajan. He didn't give us a namaskar. The next morning when I went for darshan, no, next morning, uh, you know, there was this lady uh, in West Prashanti who would play on the veena, the suprabhatam every morning. So we were staying in that wing and it was very beautiful to hear the veena play the suprabhatam. I heard that but I went back to dozing after suprabhatam. And then I had a dream. In the dream, I'm telling Swami, Swami, tomorrow we are all going back to Anandpur for the new session. Please grant us namaskar. He said, please go. And I take a beautiful namaskar. Dream ends. I wake up, I get ready, I go to Mandir for darshan. So even as I reach, one of the teachers tells me, uh, Rani, when Swami comes today, we are all going to ask Swami for namaskar. You all join in, all of us together will say, please Swami grant us namaskar. So as soon as she says this, I am thinking in my mind, I just received namaskar, it won't be right for me to ask. So I better keep quiet. But whoever came after me and sat beside me, I told them, hey, it seems the plan is that we'll all ask Swami for Namaskar. So everybody has to shout, please Swami, when Swami comes. So they all said, okay, okay. I was in the second row. Swami came. So as soon as he reached the block, everybody started, Swami, Namaskaram Swami, please Swami, please Swami. Please Swami. You know how please Swami gets momentum. Everybody said, please Swami. And I was with great restraint holding myself back. I didn't join the plea. Because I just got Namaskar. But you know when there is a mob beside you and everybody is chanting a slogan, you, you get led to it. So after a couple while, Swami just passed me by two people after me. In this, I'm in the second row, but I also very involuntarily, I said, please Swami. With everybody, I also said, please Swami. Suddenly Swami turned back. He looked at me. How many times in English? And he walked away. 
there was such a debate around me about why Swami is saying how many times? He didn't give us once and one teacher made bold to tell Swami, Swami, you didn't give us at all. Why are you saying how many times? That so much of debate was going on. I, I froze for a few minutes, so I couldn't talk. After a few minutes when I recovered, I told them, hey, hello, that was for me. You know, <laughs> I just had a dream in the morning and Swami gave me namaskar. So this how many times is probably for me because I decided not to ask and I, it happened that the plea, you know, escaped my mouth. So, that is showing you that every dream of Bhagwan is true because he decides to come in your dream. Also authenticating that he knows it by asking that question. Another instance of Sambhashana. I thought I must share this because all of us in the organization, this is a good message. This was in Brindavan. We were having an interview. So our then warden was a little unhappy with how we were all participating in the activities. So she was telling Swami, Swami, we have to force people to come and you know, it's not easy. And so Swami started advising us and Swami said, uh, you all don't have actually any problems. You're all happy people, but you create problems for yourselves by you know, thinking complicated, all that. At the end of that interview, Bhagwan said a very profound statement. He said, if you have misunderstanding, you miss God. To explain to us how we should be united, he made this statement in English. Swami said, if you have misunderstanding, misunderstanding, miss God. Now that is true when Bhagwan was there in his physical form. Because if we were not united, it immediately showed in Bhagwan's responses to us. But is it relevant today? Yes. Because if there is no harmony, it bothers our mind. And when there are so many other botherations, God cannot be there. A peaceful heart, a restful mind is possible only when there is harmony. And so I think this message is valid even today. I'll close with one or two short, quick ones. I want to talk about the last opportunity I had for some bhashan with Bhagwan. This was November 2010, Bhagwan's birthday celebrations. 23rd November, teeming crowds had gathered in the Hillview Stadium for the evening program. But the institutions that generally bake a cake for Bhagwan on his birthday had not had the opportunity to get the cake cut because Bhagwan and the devotees were in the stadium in the morning. So we got word that the cake could wait in the Kulwant Hall. As Bhagwan leaves to the stadium, he would come into Kulwant Hall, cut the cakes. So all the institutions, the hospitals, the colleges, the school, everybody. They bought a couple of cakes, seven, eight cakes. So a couple of us concerned with, in, 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 my, uh, in, in our campus, about four or five of us, because I happened to be the staff convener that year. So in my capacity as the staff convener, I was there and the warden, the director, and the people who baked the cake, and all of us were there. So Bhagwan came in, he cut the cake. Of course, that, was, that were some electrifying moments because uh, he gave uh, some uh, unforeseen occasions to hold the knife along with him to cut the cake and to light the lamp. But that apart, Bhagwan cut the cake for, all, uh, for everybody's, and then he was coming back they were all, it was already pretty late, about 6 o'clock, 6, 6.30, and crowds had been waiting in the stadium for many hours then. So everybody was making a plea to Swami to get into the car to proceed to the stadium. But Bhagwan went back to the Yajur Mandir, came back with a pile of saris. Then he started distributing saris to all of us who were there. To each of us he gave. 
And then when he, Swami was coming back, I was somewhere near the gate, Swami was, chair was exiting, the car was ready for Swami to get in to proceed to the stadium. Suddenly Swami muttered something. Now this was very difficult to hear those days. So I went closer, I said, Swami, he said, Bhaktulu, Bhaktulu. He was looking at the empty Kulvant Hall. He was looking around. Only one row of chandeliers were on. Kulvant Hall was empty because the entire space, everybody was in the stadium. He kept looking and he said, Bhaktulu. As soon as I caught it, I said, Swami, Bhaktulandaru Swami Kosam, stadium lo kaskunar Swami. All devotees are waiting for you in the stadium, Swami. That's all. The conversation, of course, Swami took a little more time to get into the car and whatever else. But for me, that one last word that I heard from Swami is Bhaktulu. Because devotees are of prime concern for Bhagwan. And I thought, all the devotees who hear this, all the devotees who are here and who will hear about this, will know that Bhagwan always, always had devotees at, on top of his mind. This naturally means that bhakti should be an essential part of our lives. That's when we become bhaktulu, whichever of us. Sometimes we become such a part of the organization and its activities. Bhakti takes a backstage over karma. You know, in the organization, Bhagwan gives opportunity for karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga. When you're doing Narayan Seva, you are in Karma Yoga. When you are doing bhajans and Nagar Sankirtan, you are in Bhakti Yoga. When you are attending a study circle or listening to a satsang talk, you are in Jnana Yoga. Swami gives a provision. Each of us has a different temperament and Swami gives a provision for each of us to participate in what suits our nature. But in the process, even while bhajan is Bhakti Yoga, Sometimes we are so caught up with which bhajan to sing, which pitch to sing, who is following, that the bhakti element goes missing. So that's why I feel from that, from that word bhaktulu, I really feel the message was, devotees are always on top of Bhagwan's mind. And bhakti is what makes us a devotee. In the very first discourse that Swami gave, 53, he says, people can be divided into four categories. The dead, those who do not believe in God or the existence of a higher power, they are all people who believe only in themselves. The sick are the people who come to God only when there is tragedy, only when there is difficulty, and when there is need. The dull, they are the ones who know that God is the supreme power, but they are too lethargic and off and on, whenever it suits them, when it's convenient, they remember God. The fourth kind, Swami says, are the healthy ones who remember God always, in all circumstances, at all times. Let us all pray to Bhagwan to keep us healthy in this sense and in all senses of the term. I wish to close with a small verse that I was inspired with in those tough days of 2011. Some say he is no more some say he is no more. But my heart says he is now more. <laughs> he is now more. The finite simply turned to become the infinite. The presence simply changed into the omnipresence. He then resided in a place. He now pervades the entire space. 
he then presided in a place he now pervades the entire space we then saw him with open eyes we now have to seek him with our closed eyes we now have to seek him with our closed eyes jai sai ram